Jeremy Sisso, welcome to An Actor Despairs. How are you doing, brother? Good, how are you? I'm good, man. It's, it's one of the greatest honors of my life to speak with you, man. You've been such a hero of mine and someone I've looked up to for so long. And a reoccurring cool. theme on this podcast is the separation between good acting and great acting. And good actors are personalities that can make a living. And great actors make such distinct and nuanced choices that aren't on the page and elevate it to a level where no other actor or actress could play that role. And everything I've seen you in, even something as, as simple as Clueless all the way to Six Feet Under, the specificity, the choices, and just your voice. You have one of the speak, best speaking voices, not only in acting, but in the world. I mean, I, you're just <laughs> born for the stage, man. And, and I love yeah. everything that you do, like, you know, break points and, and now you got FBI. And I'm so excited to talk to you, brother. Cool. Thank you for saying that, man. That, that means a lot to me. And um, yeah, I think I've probably crossed through all those different paths of good acting and great and not so good at times too. I've, I've been doing it for a long time. So I've definitely. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes you I'm, know I'm, what the, it's what the project calls for. <laughs> exactly, and yeah. everyone's got their own opinion about it. You know yeah, what I mean? So totally. it's something that I I love, others will not love as much, and. I mean, I learned that I've learned that so many times, like some of the things I'm so proud of, nobody else responds to. And, it, <laughs> it's it, funny. You know, and then other things I'm, I don't get at all. And, uh, and people seem to connect to it. So there, it, there does, you know, I, I will say I've had, I've learned, I feel like I've learned a lot by watching stuff that I've done yeah. when I was younger. Um, things that you can't really, that I couldn't really learn without really seeing, which is, Sometimes, you know, less is more, you know, sometimes you don't feel like you're feeling it exactly right inside, but it's actually perfect the way it is uh, yeah. because, because of the lighting. Sometimes you have to let the, just the, the shot, the lighting, the stillness do its thing. And, um, and that's a hard lesson to learn when you're young because yeah. you feel so fortunate to be there. You want to give it your all. And make your and stamp on it, you know? Totally. And yeah. then when in reality, the best thing to do is just to sit there and not do anything at all. That's going to be the most interesting um, thing to, to, to find. So um, it's cool. It's definitely cool talking to somebody who is a, you, you studied acting. Is that right? Yeah. I'm an, I'm an actor. You? I'm an actor. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the I never, I never went to NYU school. Like I never went to, to acting school, but I've always been intrigued by that, by, by that. I, I imagine it was a great time. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, it was tough, man. You know, it's 40 hours a week. You're not really, it's not really college. It's like, uh, it's, what's it called? Like a conservatory approach. So, right. you know, when you're, and I went to Strasbourg. So when you're 18 learning the method, it can be really intense because you're, mm. you know, you're, you're 18. You think you're so old, but you're so fucking young dude and totally. and you're using things that's like you know like i don't think they would do it anymore but they would push people to like talk about being molested and you mm -hmm. know and you just see these kids break and i my class started with 50 and by the end of year one we were down to about 28 <laughs> <laughs> but dude some people about, ended up in the fucking asylum and shit yeah, yeah. I mean, listen i mean uh, acting is a is a is a a weird thing and a lot of the schools that I went to um, I mean a lot of the classes that I took there was very there's very problematic things that happened I mean a lot of the teachers would just try to hook people up together so that you know so you know they, they put me with like a, a girl that they thought they would think I was attracted to and then make it give us these sex scenes and then like have us on stage trying to do these like you know using using acting as a way to uh, uh, kind of like get us hooked to their cloud using acting as a way oh they were like baiting you very, in it felt it felt, felt very manipulative and, and 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 strange um but uh but it's also interesting because i i did study you know when i was younger i studied different um well if it's cool let's start at the beginning where where did yeah. you grow up uh I grew up in I grew up in Chicago um, mainly, and my mom became an actress when she when when I was about six. And so, single mom, we were always with her, and so we just started auditioning for things. And, and right away, both my sister and I got a, um, a play, uh, very small roles in a play at the Goodman Theater in Chicago, a big theater. The best. And it was, it was um, Tennessee Williams' last play. He was still alive. No way. Was, 
You got to meet him? him and Yeah, I got to meet him. Wow. I, mean, I sat on his lap. I, I was six, so seven. I mean, I remember he smelled like alcohol. And, and, uh, <laughs> I was like, I didn't, I As the good writers did. A big deal. Yeah. It was obviously a big thing. They're like, yeah. remember this? So I remembered it. But, yeah. Uh, now it's actually, I just saw uh, a couple of years ago, I saw a play in, um, in LA. I think it was a, they were still developing it with Al Pacino playing Tennessee Williams. And it took place in the apartment where Tennessee lived during his last play while they were doing the production of the play that I was in. So no way. I was in the play yeah. kind of off camera. Off yeah. stage. But um, anyway, uh, you know, I, I went to some rough school. I, I had just, uh, uh, my childhood was a, a little disjointed and I, yeah. and I kind of, um, I was, uh, I, I didn't really uh, connect with kids my own age. And, and so these plays were great experiences. You know, I, I ended up doing a bunch of them and, uh, and they were, they were really, um, I think they were really, you know, um, positive experiences for me to hang out with actors or playful people, but yeah. they're, they're also adults and, and have it to be project based. And, and so I had some really great experiences doing that. It wasn't really about the acting, I wouldn't say. Um, did you know Lily Taylor? She's a friend. Oh, I love Lily. I, yeah. I, mean, I know her from Six Feet Under, but I didn't know. Oh, she was okay. She's part of actress, the Chicago, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no. Lily yeah. Taylor was, um, throughout my, my teen years, um, we used to play this game called Celebrity, where you have to guess people's names, you know? Yeah. And my favorite, I, it was, whenever it was Lily Taylor, the clue would be Jeremy's favorite actor. So when I met her, <laughs> I was very nervous. And I told her that. She's like, it's just as weird. Oh, uh, she's so, so sweet. Um, yeah. Yeah, she's great. She lives up in, uh, doesn't she live in northern, northern, upstate New York still, or no? She's there, but she lives in Brooklyn, she said. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so anyway. You. Um, yeah, you're doing this work, and are, did, are you enjoying this? Like, being that young, can you, can you put yourself back there? Like, do you remember, do you remember being happy with that, or was it terrifying? Just, like, it, was a, it was a really, a really fun experience, it's just as the experiences, the, the acting, like I said, I don't really, um, you know, I, I guess I don't remember t too much of the act, like loving the acting. I remember moments that were funny. I remember I did a big play, a big role in a big play at the Goodman theater when I was about, um, 12, I think 11 or 12. Um, and uh, I was with, it was with Brian Dennehy. It was about Bert Bertolt oh, Brecht's wow. Galileo. And, um, and uh, I remember, you know, I remember uh, falling off my chair on stage and, and I remember sleeping through a, a queue <laughs> and having to be w woken up and running on stage. Wow. And I, I remember, I remember one interesting story. I would say I would, I was, I was mostly, um, I would say I was mostly, I didn't experience a lot of strangeness with the actors. Um, being a kid that protected me from any weird things that were going on or just dynamics. But there was this one time I remember I, I, there was a theater company company that I worked with uh, quite a few times. It was a smaller theater company. Yeah. There was a group of actors who were great actors. Um, they had their day jobs. They didn't really, as far as I know, have any big ambitions. They just loved to do it. And then there was always one actor they would bring that was kind of a bit more ambitious from outside. And, um, uh, I just remember this one time, um, I think of the play was Edward the second and I, be, I was the king, I was the king at the end who came out. I, I, you know, inherited the throne and my father just died, I believe. And, and, uh, and the main actor, I think the, the actor that was a little strange was kind of challenging me and said something like, you know, that's just something I think disparaging about what I was doing at the end. So oh I went my God. And, and I did the scene and I was just bawling at the scene. And I was so proud of myself. I was like, oh, I really nailed it. And I went, and I was like, what'd you think? And he's like, a little over the top. Oh, <laughs> I was like, that guy. Yeah. Yeah. what a dick. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I uh, you know, I, I suppose I, I like the idea of being an actor. There was that, you know, um, some kind of an identity that uh, traveling around from diff different schools. Yeah. Um, but I almost got a job when I was, um, I almost got a movie when I was um, 13, 14, something like that, 15. It was, uh, it was uh, John Fontes, you know, John Fontes books, wrote yeah. Los Angeles. And, and, and there was, a, it, was a, it was a movie about that. And I, I went, flew somewhere to test for it. And um, I was the only one reading for the lead. And I went back and I was in a new school. And I remember telling all, my, all these people that I got the job. Wow. 
And I didn't. Ah. And it was a good thing that I didn't because if I got it at that point, I was so desperate for, you know, affirmation that I was really ready to use all that um, uh, at the wrong time in my life. Yeah. Um, a couple of years later, when I did actually get a job, I was very lucky to get cast in Larry Kasdan's Grand Canyon, um, yeah. which was my first big movie. And, and, and they, um, you know, I, I was playing his son. He must have, I must have reminded him of, uh, of Jake Kasdan, his son. And um, I'm still confused why I got the role. I, was, it's, I watched it. I was so just awkward and uncomfortable. And I remember I was, I had no, no idea what I was doing. Yeah. I remember Mind one blind. scene out. I was one, one scene I was, um, so I'll just tell you a little about my, my state of, of uh, understanding of acting or whatever at the time. I, I became uncertain what to do with my mouth at the end of each line. And so if you watch really closely in this one scene, I'll say a line, there'll be a brief pause, and then my mouth will shut. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta watch so that. <laughs> that is where my, my head was. So then after high school, I moved to LA and I was like, all right, I have to figure out what I'm doing. And that's when I started taking all those classes. What, what made and, you just decide with, you know, doing so much rich theater, what made you choose LA over New York just because you wanted film and TV or? Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, I, you know, my, I think, I think um, the idea of having any kind of a career, a real career in, in movies or TV was, was a real long shot for yeah. my mom in her mind. And for me, I guess, as well. It seemed like, um, it didn't seem like, um, <clears throat> it seemed a little more like a lottery. Yeah. And I, was, I had this opportunity. I had just done this movie. I had a big agent telling me to come to LA. And if I... If I had thought about it differently, you know, if I had a little bit more confidence in the long game, then I, I very well might have come come to New York. But throughout all of those early years, I was pretty desperate to pretty desperate um, to continue a career that I was pretty certain wouldn't continue. Wow! So, which is not a which is not a great place to, to no, operate. Not from, at all. Yeah. You know, uh, but when I started taking these classes. You know, um, and I remember that the night before I started taking my first class, Howard Howard Stein. Oh yeah, Howard Stein. Yeah, great, great. Uh, Jay Kasdan and, and and another friend, uh, Larry Kasdan, the guy the guy whose role I was based on. Um, it's a filmmaker, great filmmaker. Now um, he called me, and, and this other friend called me, and they tried to talk me out of taking the class. They said you have a natural thing, class is going to mess you up, and I was like. It was, I was, it was nice to get that call. It was an interesting yeah, call to get. Yeah, was yeah, very clear. I was like, I need to, I need to figure, well, I figure something out. Yeah, Otherwise, get some kind of a I system not? or, you know, totally. Yeah. And so it was always difficult for me. I mean, I think I have some kind of a undiagnosed learning disability or some kind of dyslexia or something because my, my brain operates differently than some, I think. I mean, I think we all operate very differently, but yeah. most of the classes I was in were, spoke about acting as if there was only one way. And a lot of the, the tricks and tools that you would have to use, such as, um, you know, uh, uh, what was it called? Emotional recall or yeah. where you have to put yourself back and, you know, got to be 14 years ago or more. And you have to very, remember yeah, the remember the wallpaper i'm like i don't remember the wallpaper yeah i, the I, I can't remember touch the cup of coffee yeah. yeah yeah um yeah touch the cup of coffee the yeah. and, and yeah. anytime i would have like a sort of emotional thing in these classes it was usually by secretly doing it another way and then the teachers would be like oh you did it right you know and i'd be like i wouldn't tell them I'm like, <laughs> i got but it was <laughs> it was very, it was it was in some ways probably a uh, uh, discouraging feeling of like I, I can't quite I'm not, I don't I'm not doing what I'm yeah. supposed to be doing in this um and uh and so I oftentimes I would spend a large portion of the time trying to excavate uh people from the class I'm not sure if that's the right word but getting people out of the class because there were some kind of abusive situations going yeah. on where the yeah. teachers were very, very mean. And I, I just didn't like how that looked at all. No, I think um, that's why that show Barry's so accurate, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> did you have, I mean, weird, weird, did you have teachers that looking back felt like they were too, um, do you feel like them 
you know, talking about them, making the kids talk about the molestation and all that stuff was a, a, a good, or would you say that was a, not a, a good thing to do? It, it certainly got a reaction out of them, but I don't think when you're 18, you're quite yet ready to explore that in a public environment with, you know, 50 other people watching, you know, and I think it was really kind of abusive. And I, I started to hate the studio. And in fact, to tell you, 100% true story. While I was there, NYU, you go, you pay, essentially the way NYU works is you pay the money to get the degree from NYU, but you go to an outside studio, like Strasburg is open to the public, Stella Adler is open to the public, Playwright Horizons, and you study at one of these ones where you're assigned, and it, uh... So Tish doesn't have its own, like, classes? They do, they do now. It's a very new thing. Yeah. So, but it... Oh, it, interesting. It, but uh, yeah, I think I got in a really wrong program, and they and they fired Strasburg. Oh really? Oh, yeah, interesting. They, they got rid of the program. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were some good ones. There was one guy named John Lynn who I liked a lot. Um, but man, could he talk? These guys. I mean, they just some of them. He liked to talk for. He would talk yeah. for an hour and a half, and it's about the same kind of stories. You know, he trained Dustin Hoffman in this one uh, time, and so he yeah. tell the same stories over and over again. But it was a cool class because it would uh you do the same character for uh a few months and you would do these half an hour long improvs you'd say okay i want to i want to explore the time this character got when he got married and you'll cast different actors in the class you're going to be my wife you're my dad and you kind of set up a an improv and you kind of carry out this long improv on stage wow. again i didn't i it seemed, it was a great idea and i saw some really cool things mine were always never never that never that good and stunted it was always like what happens next but um i like the i like the concept of it where do you feel like you started to cultivate your voice was there a certain studio you got to or was it on a project or was it an amalgamation of of all, all things yeah it was, I guess it was working. So what happened is I, I took some classes and, and, and then I, and then, you know, I, when I came to LA, I, I had a big agent, but I, I couldn't get a job for a year and got dropped by my agent and um, got another agent and then, um, and then got a, and, and kind of decided in my mind, okay, if I'm going to do this weird acting thing, I want to, and I'm not going to college, um, then I want to, I want to choose characters that I don't understand. Yeah. And that I can research and understand, you know, so it forces me to do some kind of, you know, um, studying. And so, you know, soon after that and soon after this class, I got this role as um, a mid-operative transsexual guy, which is, you know, you, you, you actually are not allowed to play those <laughs> anymore. Yeah, I, I know. But, yeah. But back in my day, like, that's what you did. To well, I, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I won't. It, yeah, but totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's a, a fluid argument. I think it's a specific time we're in, which is really important that, yeah. that all of that is. Uh, but regardless of, of that, uh, at the time, it was very exciting. It was Vigo Mortensen. It was this oh, weird wow. independent movie called The Crew. If you can find it, check it out. Because yeah, I will. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. And it was a really, it was probably one of, one of my better sort of things that performances wise. I mean, maybe it wasn't altogether, but it just, you know, I, and at the time I, I you know, I, I went to support groups for transsexuals. I, I would have, I would, I would, um, you know, dress up in a certain way and go into Santa Monica Boulevard and kind of have, you know, you know, conversations and develop friendships with, with people as this character and really do like methody kind of things that, that, uh, that I, I haven't done for years. And, and, and then, um, and then the, 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 the thing went, was great. Um, it was, I was an insecure kid for sure and sensitive, but it wasn't until my next project that I, um, called Hideaway, which yeah. I, which I got, which is my first studio movie. I mean, besides Grand Canyon and, and I was a killer and, and it was, and I was very excited about it, but I had sort of like acne. I was like 19. Yeah. So they asked me to do Accutane, which is, I just, took 20 rounds of Accutane. Okay. Well, I don't know still got the little. Yeah, I know it well. <laughs> <laughs> a big, a big side effect of of, Acu, of Accutane is depression. De extreme. Like you, they make you sign huge. a suicide waiver where if you, yeah, you, yeah, you can't sue them. And there's period. there's multiple stories of people going back and like 
harming their doctor. I mean, anyway, it's a, it's a pretty bad, a bad drug. Yeah. It was for me because I got super, um, and I honestly, I don't know exactly what my path would have been if that hadn't happened, but I know I took that and I, be, I became, I got really, really depressed and the depression, a lot of it hovered around feeling like I was, I was blowing it. Like I wasn't able to do this job to act well enough. Yeah. I would read books of serial killers. I would, do, I would, spend hours of just obsessing about these scenes that I'd have to do in a month or whatever. Yeah. I'd show up to do the scene and I do it and none of it, there was no way to like achieve what I was like feeling inside. It was, uh, or, you know, yeah. the many, many moments I had in my bedroom alone where that seemed brilliant. There was no way I could bring those back. And so I would kind of push the performance in, in you know, for me, it was not something that I like to watch. It seems very forced. Um, and, uh, and also it, I think that whether it's, whether people like it or not, um, uh, walking away after those scenes, I was, ju I just felt like what just happened all yeah. that time leading up to this one, you know, half an hour while we're filming that close up. And that's what it was. And I, I didn't, I don't think I did anything. Did I do, you know, having no understanding of what it means to do something in film and the lighting and yeah. how all the other stuff has to, you know, you know, like I learned from watching myself a lot about, you know, sometimes you just have to not do very little and that's going to be your most powerful moment. Yeah. And that feels completely counterintuitive to when you get a job you've worked so hard at. Yeah. It's very hard to be like, all right, you know, I know you worked really hard to get this and you achieve this and, but just look, just sit there and look and just be and and be relaxed and look up. That's all your, that's all, that's the best you can do right now. Yeah. It's hard to believe that that's the case. And, um, and so anyway, that, that experience was really, really rough. And then I, you know, and then I did Clueless, which was fine. It was a kind of a short one. It was. Yeah. I mean, was that, I mean, obviously that's, in in history has become a seminal film but at the mm. time i'm sure you had no idea that it was going to be this you know classic not at all and yeah. i was i was um i wasn't embarrassed of it for a long time but i was i was worried that that's the only thing i'd be known for i wouldn't have a career anymore and then i'd be you know, taken I'd, seriously I'd, I'd, I'd be selling cars and I'd be the guy from that felt worse than <laughs> yeah. not doing it. Yeah. Um, because the other movies I did, I did another movie called, I did a few movies that time, but one of them was White Squall, which was another time that I got pretty dark and felt like it was a Ridley Scott movie with Jeff Bridges. It was, yeah. you know, uh, you know, and that was when I was working with that teacher, John Lennon. And, and again, just a very similar feeling. Uh, this is, uh, Clueless was fun. It was in LA. Uh, you have a tendency to, when you're shooting in your hometown, it's not usually as immersive of an experience. Yeah. Um, you go back to your own life. And, and, and so, um, and it was a comedy. And, and so I didn't get too, too dark about that one. No, but, you, you know, the character didn't require it. Yeah. It didn't yeah. require it. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm sure I didn't feel amazing i didn't i know i didn't feel like i knocked it out of the park on that either but you no, went, you stole the moment yeah it's a great scene it's a very famous scene you know yeah just listening yeah for in, in, you know from from my standpoint though i yeah I, you know, of course i was never course. felt like i just none of it felt none of it felt yeah. like i knew what the hell i was going for yeah. what was what was success what was what, what it was it was succeeding i mean the only thing that that i could gather at the time you know it was a period in the early 90s when method acting when you know val kilmer Marlon brando kind of these daniel day troubled, lewis. troubled actors daniel day lewis yeah, yeah i mean it was even before a little before daniel day lewis really was what he is um i mean he was still there but it didn't have the same um connotation it was more that um in the sense that troubled actors that were kind of jerks and kind of put um their performance above being good people and yeah. were eccentric and weird. Like that was, that was what you kind of wanted to be. That was like, so there Sean was a Penny. feeling of like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There was, the, so it was just a very confusing, um, uh, a confusing, um, thing to try to 
understand what where the goal marks were, what I was going for. So what was um, your anyway, barometer? You know, like exactly. Your, That's yeah. my point. There yeah. was the, it was it was changing. It was yeah. it was liquid. It was un, it was confusing, and ultimately, it just felt like I was I was failing at whatever it is because I didn't have it. You know, I did this uh, movie, uh, White Squall, traveled around with all these young guys. I, that was another one where I just felt like, man, I put so much time into this script, into this thing, and I can't, I can't achieve it. I can't achieve in the scene or I'm pushing too hard. And then I remember one scene where I just, I couldn't, you know, something I did in the audition, which I could really, I had a great moment in the audition, but when we're filming it with all the set, the pressure of all that, I just wasn't able to feel anything about what I was supposed to feel. And man, what a fucking, what a, yeah. a horrible feeling walking away yeah. from set in this huge movie with this legendary. And you're like, wow, I just did not, I wasn't, you know, I, I couldn't get there. And, um, and so anyway, um, I went back, eventually I, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know what happened first. I think, you know, before I, before I, you know, I took, I started taking, I started taking antidepressants at a certain point and that really did help me. But I think I kind of made um, some, some boundaries as far as, or made some uh, progress in, in terms of, you know, how I perceived my acting and, and how I, um, you know, um, how I understood it um, before that. And it's, I, th I think it maybe started around Suicide Kings. Okay. Um, um, and it was, uh, you know, again, I, I, I think that, that director probably helped me out a lot because I went into that audition with this long, um, set of, uh, uh, how I saw the character really way too much thought put into all this. Yeah. It was really interesting. It was very thought out, but after he cast me, he's like, you know, I, I think maybe I just want you to kind of like be like a good friend. Like you're just, you're kind of like you, like you're cool, kind of like trying to just tell me to back off the work and, and it really released me. And that was kind of the first time that I started feeling a confidence about, oh, you know what? I don't have to try to be something that, that I'm not. I don't yeah. have to try to prove that I'm some other version of me. In fact, what's more interesting for me is to, is to, to just let anything uh is to not plan everything yeah. to just trust that something interesting will happen and that it doesn't have to be deliberate everything doesn't have to be deliberate um so beautiful and so that kind of started there and then you know i you know i think i did a movie called trash which was you know was like, my whole process of acting happened in that 90s independent film world yeah which is a really special time yeah it was like hundreds of movies that you'd never heard of ones that and wouldn't get made today you know it's no it's, way no yeah way. yeah and uh and you go and this one was trash it was like very typical of the 90s kind of thing i was you know the couple of white trash kids you know stuck in their hometown angry at their abusive parents and it was with my friend Eric Michael Cole and 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 Jamie Presley was in it and my ex girlfriend at the time and it was I was kind of the king of the set you know what I mean yeah. and I and everyone just loved what I was doing and I, you know I was very self indulgent and uh, and that and that was an amazing you know amazing experience to be able to feel that um, in a in a in a in a um, in, in an environment that didn't have the high stakes of you know, you, you, a Ridley you Scott get a, film, you yeah, know. yeah, Any yeah. studio movie, yeah, In studio movies, you're gonna feel like there's just gonna be people there who are like, please don't mess up, yeah, where you know, which is a, which is a different thing. Um, but then it was Six Feet Under, I guess, after that, which was really the thing that. Well, you you went out uh, for Titanic, didn't you? I did. Yes, that's a funny thing because it's just a glimpse into that period for me, yeah. which was a period of years of just trying to get jobs doing yeah. everything i could can to get jobs and that that one was funny because jim cameron didn't see me as that character i met with him he had cast me in something you you before. screen tested with with Kate winslet i did but that was yeah. mainly because i i convinced him to let me do it i i he cast me in a movie before that uh, that never got made and then this thing came up i went in and met him and he told my agents no you know he's not right and I wrote him this letter 
and this is before like the internet. <laughs> and uh, I, I love up, this. I, I made up a quote from Truffaut <laughs> that was like specifically about my, uh, you know, why he should cast me in this role. Not that Truffaut was talking about me, but it was like a quote. That yeah, I found. it's Roman and, and Jason. It was a beautifully, it must have been a beautifully written letter because he then brought me in to test me with Kate Winslet, two other actresses, full wardrobe, full crew. And, and you know, and, and again, it was another experience where I, busted my ass tried you know yeah. and you can just see it i thought you that. were great man i i love it i've seen thank the screen you. tests you were so good thank you i yeah i mean i i you know everyone everyone has that's the thing about acting everyone you i you know for me though it, i could see me working really hard and yeah. i could see all those acting classes of like you know try this try put that a, put an image in your head and yeah. so there are, so to me it comes off a little creepy a little weird because i'm not actually present i'm actually imagining these i remember that there's a scene where i'm talking about her hands or something and i'm yeah. trying to remember this thing that is you know i put some image in my head and to me i'm watching it and i'm like that just seems a, it's a little creepy like he's gone <laughs> off to another place like he's like it was a darker was, jack <laughs> <laughs> he's like a psycho a little bit and i'm like that's just what my acting teacher told me to do yeah like, totally you fucked me <laughs> <laughs> and so uh and so, so then, then um, I auditioned for it, you know. Uh, so at a certain point, I got lighter about the whole thing. It what just, is it? It's true. Uh, Alan Ball wrote the role for you of Billy Genoweth, right? Pretty much. I mean, I, I, I'm not exactly sure if he. Uh, uh, I think he. I think he had an idea of a, of having Brenda's have a, a manic depressive or bipolar brother. Um, uh, but uh, I tested for David, uh, the gay brother, and yeah. um, and uh, you know. The um, the family that I was paired up with, the brother that was reading, that was matched. Which, it me. wasn't Peter Krause. No, we oh. had, there was a couple different families kind of testing that looked similar. And got it, got the it. Guy, my Nate, um, I won't say who it is, but yeah. he kind of bombed every time I see him. Like, <laughs> Dude, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I fucked you, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then, yeah, then I got a call, and he said, you know, this role come and do this one one day, and then if the show goes, you know, we'll make it into a role and. And, you know, I, I, I could have no idea what that, what that was going to be, but that was, that was the first time I was able to um, experience success. Clueless, like I said, always felt like, like it wasn't, it wasn't my success. It yeah. wasn't, it was just something I, I happened in and, and, and this felt like. Um, it was you. Of, like it was a success that also that I could really appreciate. I was appreciative of being on something that felt like it was, changing things that's what it felt well, like it, it literally did i mean that the it modern did, uh, landscape of television would not exist without billy chenelith or you know mcnulty from the wire or, you know yep. gandolfini from sopranos those shows change what everything that would exist now you know and talk to me about like all you know obviously spoiler alert billy chenelith has mental illness do you feel like all these crazy things that you were dealing with emotion wise all of a sudden became applicable to this character and you could use it in a healing way or did it not work out so Disney-like? Yeah, I mean, interesting. I, I, I guess I guess at that point I, I had, um, I, you know, I, I had backed off a bit uh, yeah. from trying to, um, trying to understand everything about what I was doing. Um, and uh, I would, I also figured out that it's different for me every time what's going to get me into into a place of being connected to what I'm doing. And that's the trick for me, you know, to this day. It's like if I'm having to be emotional about something, sometimes I'll have to think about something about one of my kids and, you know, sometimes that doesn't work. I have to think yeah. about something else. Sometimes I don't have to think about anything. It's my brain is kind of always, you know, doing its own thing and I have yeah. to kind of try to catch up with it. But, um, but yeah, the character though Billy was different, different than me um, as far as you know the, the, the mental struggles that I well, was having. I, with I didn't mean to imply that. I'm sorry. I hope no, that, no, uh, not uh, a, uh, no, no, uh, not at all. Yeah. But uh, but in answering your question, uh, it was you know Billy was a really such a clearly drawn character. Um, I felt like I I understood him. Um, and he had that kind of that manic up yeah. side, which is such a, uh, you know, so between the manic upside, the depression, sure, when he would get dark, 
but he was pretty selfish when he would get dark too. Yeah. I was very, uh, I put it all on myself. Like it was all me. No one could help me. No one could save me. And, and Billy had a tendency to get Brenda really, or really put a lot yeah, on Brenda yeah, yeah. when he was, when he was low. Um, but it was just, it just felt like such a well-drawn, well-understood character from the right standpoint of the writing um, that it felt like, um, it felt like, uh, I don't know why, honestly, I don't know why I suddenly didn't feel um, uh, overwhelmed by the, because it was for sure, I think part of it was that he wrote it for me, even if yeah. he didn't write it for me, he knew I was cast in it when he wrote those scenes. So I felt like, oh. He, he believes knows. in me, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think earlier on, I, I kind of felt like I had tricked my way in you know with these yeah. auditions I was good at and so I was always trying to be something I didn't think I actually could be whereas for whatever reason I felt I felt in a good place at this time to feel like you know this this is a version of me if I put myself in this you know then it's really it'll be really interesting um and that really was you know that was a five-year experience that um that that I was able to evolve with and grow with and, and was just a, a big part of, of who I am as an actor. And looking back on that, was that a good time in your life? Yeah, that was amazing. That was probably the best time. Wow, um, that, I love it. Was that. Just a, you know, it was just a, you know, I had a group of friends. It was, you know, hey, 20s are fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, 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 how old are you? You're in your... I'm thir I'm turning 31. My 20s were a nightmare. I was an addict running around fucking drinking and drugging his way to, you know, answers. And uh right. Yeah, yeah. yeah to questions I didn't um, want to ask, but you know, man, I when you come out of a show that's that Titanic winning pun intended, winning uh Golden Globes and Emmys and things like that, I imagine you had a lot of flexibility in what you wanted to do. Um you know, it never felt, um, it never felt like, like that. Again, I was, I've always, I'm always, I'm a fairly just insecure guy. I don't, I don't be, I don't have like this overriding confidence that, that, you know, things are going to work out. And so I'm always You're coming an artist. With a little, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think some, some of these actors have, you know, I think it's a good quality to be like, well, it's delusional, and, pathological and um, envious in some ways, but in others, I'm absolutely not, you know, <laughs> Whatever it, whatever it is, it's, you know, it's not as bad as it was for sure. And it gave me, it just gave me a real calling card of like, whatever else happens, I'm on this show that really is meaningful. And, um, and yeah, I was, you know, there was, there was definitely enough interest in, in me as an actor that I felt like um, I was excited about what came next. And, yeah. and then I you know, got cast in this, thing called kidnapped which was a, a short-lived show that was on network and i was like the um you know was, each season follows a, a kidnapping case and i was the kidnapping specialist dark past you know kind of cool yeah uh, character and i'd never kind of seen myself as that before and no one else had really seen me as that before so that was really fun to to do and yeah. opened up you know uh, a, another level of confidence i guess um, and then jumping into Law and Order for three years, right? Yeah. Was that was that a good time in your life? Like, I, you know, talk to me for the actors listening right now because I think procedurals are the hardest to bring truth to because you have this vernacular and you have these rules and and sometimes the dialogue is like it's not an actor's dream and you have to be like, there's an APB on a rape victim at Staten Island. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, so and you were so amazing in that. How was it jumping from something? It was like tough. No. Initially, it was tough because you have to learn to not follow. You know, you kind of. Excuse me, I'm eating right now. I no, it's all good. I'm yeah. Gonna, yeah. Gonna pass out. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, uh, but um, so what I was saying is, um, you have to say it. You have to say. You know, as an actor, you kind of train yourself. You know, or I guess I'll I'll say that as I got more comfortable, the thing that I started to rely on was my instincts uh, of when something feels right, real, good, you know, like a good scene, like a good moment. And when it feels forced. Yeah. And, you know, you're that blinker is going off like crazy in your first 
few episodes of Law and Order because yeah. you're saying things that no nobody should nobody would say. People don't because, speak that way. Yeah. Yeah, because the yeah. audience needs to understand what's happening. Yeah. And I'd be like, why is my character saying this right now? It feels wrong. And then um and then when Anthony Anderson came on the show, any line I didn't want to say, he'd be like, I'll take it. And then <laughs> he would just commit to it. It would be great. And I was like, that's the thing I need to get better at. Yeah. And it's not a, it's kind of an instinct that you want to try to forget when you're on other projects because it's a really good instinct to have as an actor to be like, this doesn't feel right in my body yeah. for some reason. But on, on a show like the one I'm on now, sometimes things aren't going to feel exactly right. And that doesn't mean that they're, they're not exactly right for what you're doing. Yeah. It's, it's a different world tonally and aesthetically. And 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 then talk to me. You started getting into to, to writing. Like I, I love Breakpoint. Was that something? Was tennis a part of your life? Like talk to me about how this film came together. Um, yeah, my friend Gene Hong, who uh, was the writer on on the thing, we came up with the story together. And uh, yeah, we used to play tennis a lot together, and we always felt, you know, we liked we both liked sports comedies. Yeah, um, the Bull Durham's and the Tin Cups of it all, and and um, you know, there is there is a. Uh, there, there's not, there was not been a lot of great tennis movies. So we, um, yeah, we came up with that idea and, um, and Gene wrote the script and, and then, uh, yeah, I spent about three or four years trying to get money. It was my first experience with that. And it was, um, exhausting and. and was it my rewarding was to, or? Yeah. I mean, it depends on, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it doesn't feel like it was worth it all because, um, because, uh, well, just because it wasn't, seen enough it wasn't yeah. as, as successful as i wanted it to be and um i think the movie's really good i, like I think it's great jk simmons amy smart man like some yeah. of the best you know but you? i uh yeah dave walton was amazing <laughs> yeah. yeah we we but we you know i think i definitely um if i were to do it again there's 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 choices that are hard like i i i, I needed to get it made yeah because i didn't believe i could get it made and so I, I cut some corners um, in the name of getting it done. And, and maybe that would have um, changed the narrative. But, you know, I, I suppose um, I suppose it, it was a great experience. I, I, I can't, you know, it was a great experience. I, I, I feel, I mean, I was definitely felt proud that I was able to get it done. I felt it was, you know, I felt like yeah, I, should if be. it wasn't for me, that I wouldn't not have happened. It was the yeah. one project I've done where I, like, carried it up the hill. And it was like. It was a coup, man. This, man. Yeah. That's so beautiful. Yeah. I'm proud of you, brother. Experience. Is that is that something that's you think you'll do more of eventually, or mm. you know, you got this sweet network gig, you know, like you think you'll 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 start your own company, and or is it was it too much? Um, I would like to, you know, I've I've always um, I, I I like to make. I think I could be a good director, but there's certain certain parts of the directing that is not within my skill set which is again it's a, the, the producerial aspect which yeah. is just money the, i don't know if i budget. have that just the pushing it forward the committing yeah. and being like this is going to be the selling that's what yeah, it is. yeah there's a certain amount of selling that has to go from the directing i love making movies and editing cutting the willie loman of it all you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. that part's super hard for me but yeah. if if things fall into place that would be definitely something i'd love to do and and I still, you know, I still do some some writing things. I have a project that I'm I'm writing for um, for Sony right now with a couple of writers. And awesome, I, dude. You know, so I'm, I I I try. I try. Writing is another thing that's super challenging challenging for me. Um, but uh, but I I I'm always I'm always in the game of of just trying to create, which I guess we all are. Well, before we dig into the final season, or the upcoming season three of FBI, I'd love to talk to you about your stage work for a minute because I am dying to fucking see you on stage, dude. Like, I just think it would just it would teach me so much, and the great artists steal, and I constantly steal from you. And talk to me about like you know you did Bo Willman's play at Manhattan Theater Club. You know, like is that something that you find imperative to come back to every so often, getting on stage? I would love that. Um, it's hard. It's hard with kids right now. It's, yeah. um, the, you know, just financially, it's not, it's not a, it's not uh super Rewarding. lucrative. And, yeah. and so there's that, there's that issue just in this time in my life that it's, so it doesn't seem, you know, 
that's not going to happen for a little while. I'm hoping to ride this FBI, FBI thing out. <laughs> yeah, you so, will. So uh, I'm, I'm not looking to. I've had like four to, auditions, so hopefully I'll see you on set soon. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> we'll do that. Um, what were they for? Ah, oh, dude, co-star, guest star shit, you know. Like I got this. What little... do you usually, what, what's your, your um, what are you seen as by your agents? What do they put you out for? I do a lot of kind of young you stuff, like kind of brooding or, you know, mentally or, or yeah. FBI or, you know, like officer, I mean, you know, and like the brooding cop or, you know, the most of the stuff I've done is that, you know. Uh, back in my this dream, it, it was more damage stuff. But now I think I've kind of come out of all the the chaos with a sense of humor so you know i think i'm less less dark than i was but maybe i'm not i don't know you know it's the hardest part in this business is you know the objectivity of the subjectivity you know what i mean because it's not how you feel about you it's how other people see you and you have no control over that you know you can see yourself as something and people see you as something so fucking different yeah, but. yeah. There's a you know we have a lot of characters in the jock, which is kind of um, fun in the office place where I work that have you know these super informational lines. Yeah, the exposition. They're solving exposition. crimes. Exposition. Yeah, but it's really it's really hard to do. Those guys are and they're they're it's it's not an easy it's not an easy gig. And one of our actresses who's in the jock has a really big episode this week. You know, she um, I actually had called the writer. In a couple of weeks ago, I'm like, you know, maybe we could give them a little bit more. So and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, I don't know why he didn't tell me, but the script came out like the next day. And one of these uh, characters who really has only said informational things, you know, gets, she's got a bomb around her neck and she's calling her, her, her baby, her child. And, and she's, you know, in this deep kind of storyline. So it was a really big kind of celebration. Oh, that's us. awesome. Because all my stuff's been, it's been, yes, we got an APB on blah, blah, blah. And then I had to do the gun thing and they wanted me to do it. They wouldn't let me use like this thing. They they wanted me to do it with a finger. And it's just like, you never feel cool doing that, man. You know, so not funny. since I was like six years old that I felt cool. I know. I never thought I was supposed to fake holding the gun. Yeah. Your finger's supposed to be out. And it's like, who, who, who brought the real gun to an audition and fucked it for all of us, you know? But that's awesome, man. Yeah. So talk to me working, you know, in these crazy times filming. How has that been? Um, yeah, it's been good. That was my last piece. It's all good. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, it was. It's been. Um, it's been fine. You know, it's they're just they just gave us watches the other day that we have to hold in our pocket that buzz whenever we're near somebody, and I guess if somebody gets it, then they'll know who was in contact with that person. Wow. We have to be in separate pods, and but basically everyone just has to wear masks and and shields. And um, do you guys still have so extras? Yeah. Wow. My stuff is mainly inside this room with like 40 different extras and I'm walking around spitting on everybody. So if I get it, it's going to be a real problem. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, it's, 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 it's been, it's been good. It's a good, good episode tonight. And, and um, you know, it's nice to be on something that, that feels stable. It's a, yeah, it's a strange thing. These procedurals the have world. like, these procedurals, they just have really committed, committed audiences. There's, there's a, millions and millions of people who just rely on this stuff as their main source of entertainment. And, and, and so it's, it's a privilege to be, to be on it. And, and the character they write for me, which is only comes up a couple times a season is deep. I'm, you know, an alcoholic and, and have yeah. a history of that. And, you know, and, and that, that, that pops up, pops up in some pretty, pretty nice, nice episodes. And the rest of the time, is this weird scene that I have to do over and over and over again, where I'm in this jock trying to yelling at people to get this information together and yeah. the scene could really not be good. Um, and so that kind of the stakes of, of, of me trying to make it work, keep it exciting for me and make it like a challenge. Um, Law and Order, I had more trouble asking questions, being on the street and being like, where were you on Tuesday? Yeah. Those scenes really bored me. As an I actor. know, I can I imagine. Could not <laughs> get super into them. I, mean, I liked watching them and, and, you know, walking onto the crime scene was, was fun. Yeah. But I just didn't feel like it was difficult at all for me. Well, it must have been great that, that that fucking Dick Wolf loved you and brought you back, man. 
Oh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's, he's, uh, he's, he is, uh, I definitely, um, see him as a, <clears throat> a paternal figure or kind of like a, someone I'm really grateful for. That's great, man. Well, dude, final two questions. Uh, and thank you so much for everything, man. It's been such an honor. And oh, oh we... theater. That's what we didn't talk about. Oh yeah. Theater. Yeah. Yeah. So you did <laughs> Bose play. You talk to me about that. Yeah. So, you know, in, since my, since I've been an adult, I've done only a, a few, a few things on stage. One was like a one man show that somebody else wrote and, and see brother. Good. Okay. Um, happy birthday. And, um, so, uh, um, so yeah, so one was a one man show. That was an amazing experience. Um, yeah. and, uh, and a little small theater in LA. And then I, I did a, um, I, I finally got a play on Broadway and the first day of rehearsal was September 11th, 2001. Supposed to be first day of rehearsal. Oops. My earpiece. And, um, it was a big comedy with Sarah Jessica Parker. And so we went to, you know, we went to do the, um, we went to do, to start rehearsal like three or four days later. And, and uh, I, I just was, I didn't feel very funny. Yeah. You know? um, it was with some great comedians. Alan uh, Tudyk, who was in Suburgatory with me. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, was in it. And anyway, a few days later, I got fired. The director called me and was like, it's not working out. We're going to go our separate ways. So I was kind of pretty hurt but uh, yeah with the tragedy that had just occurred i i i, I, I didn't stay very long in a self-pity place but uh, yeah. uh so there was that and then i did a, a play uh, on broadway called festin which was based on the celebration which was from the dogma 95 period you know yeah. about those movies in yeah the of course yeah. and um and it was a uh, interesting it was a very dark play um and uh and you know it was my first experience on broadway and it didn't get very well uh, good reviews so i got to have that experience of what it was oh, to walk God, on stage get the day on. after the review <laughs> yeah and it's like i mean it just it was just crazy like the day before in previews people were like responding in a different way as soon as those reviews came oh, out fuck ben people <laughs> would yeah would just yeah. respond would sitting in the audience like so that was interesting, and then yeah, finally I did Bill, uh, Bo Willimon's play, and that was a that was a really much more of a complete experience. Challenging. I mean, it was um, I was on stage the whole time, and it yeah. was like a long monologue where I, you know, where I'm dying basically. But it kind of goes off the, becomes very abstract, and and so it was just a very ambitious play, and um, and uh, it was right when my my daughter was born, so a lot was going on. Oh, wow. It was a really, really great, great, um, challenging experience that um, that was was. Oh, I also did Take Me Out. That was an amazing experience. Take oh. Me Out was during was during that period. I think it was either during Six Feet Under or not. But I played. Um, was Shane. that the one in LA that you did? Yeah. 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 And that was that was a that was a great experience. It was you know I, I played a, a real redneck kind of racist kind of really really you know. Um, um, not a very bright fellow, but also just a really troubled and not a good person. Um, and, uh, and I was just on stage for a period of time. And when I was on stage, there were intense scenes. And, uh, and that was, uh, that was a really, that was a really great, great experience. That was, um, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it was, it was, uh, I, I, you know, I guess because I didn't go to theater school, I, I kind of, have to approach it a little differently. Uh, so yeah, some, well, that was your some, Juilliard. It sounds like all those productions. Yeah, you know? it's just a lot of. I've worked with a lot of people who've trained at Juilliard and stuff like that, and they're it's it's you know not that they're all like this, but they're trained in a way to be the same every night. Like yeah. it's got to feel the same, and I just have never been able to get my head around that. Yeah. I've got to change it up every night to try to find well, something new. Well, I think new, it breathes that way. I agree with that approach. You know what I mean? Yeah. It shouldn't be the same every night because it's a play and it's live and it's, you know, it breathes and it oscillates and the audience and your feeling, it all changes, you know? It's like- Totally. Yeah. But the, from a producer standpoint, yeah, it sucks because sometimes the performances aren't as good because yeah. you know, <laughs> I've tried a thing and I yeah. have to work yeah. other nights that's magic. Yeah. Um, so- for whatever reason, you know, that this is, you know, LA theater is interesting because it's just, 
the stakes aren't as high. The, yeah. the Broadway thing was like, so that was my first time on the stage. And, and then I did another play at the Amundsen called The Dead End, which was another good experience. Anyway, in New York, it was, a, it was, it was, it was different. The, um, the, the stakes are higher. The reviews are more important. Um, but in all cases, I, uh, I kind of committed to being a type of actor that, um, that has to change it up in order to be alive. And, and everyone was pretty, pretty cool with it. You know, no one really, um, got too frustrated with it. I, I, you know, I, I think I, I think I wasn't destructive in it. Yeah. I wasn't like, I wasn't taking chances that, um, that ran the risk of the show falling apart, yeah. but I, I would allow myself to follow a thread of uh, how I was feeling and kind of play it out. And sometimes it didn't hit as hard and sometimes it hit really, really well. So, um, so yeah, I really, I do, I do, I do enjoy that experience. It's very, very different than doing TV or, or, yeah. or film. Um, hey, I can't wait, man. But, let's, let's get one together. But uh, let's do it. yeah. So before I jump into my final two questions, I do want to talk to you about Wichita, the short film right now. Yeah. How, how did that come your way? Oh, um, so there's um, a friend of mine, Jason Lesnar, puts on the show every year where he um, where he gets a bunch of writers um, uh, to sit down with uh, people who have experienced homelessness in L.A. and talk to them. And I, I wrote one, so uh, the process is pretty interesting. You talk to him for hours and then you come up with a story and then you write this monologue. And then he does uh, he puts puts on this show. Um, well, it's a group of, uh, uh, of monologues and he puts it on like 80 different venues all around the city, all different casts, all different directors and stuff uh, to raise money and awareness for the homeless situation. And anyway, this was, uh, uh, Sergian was a director on one of those shows that, um, that I, I, I felt, uh, you know, se seemed like she had a real ambition and, yeah. and, a, and a, you know, a right, a good eye and, and so I said, if you have anything, let me know. And then, yeah, she put this thing together and it was, it was a nice experience, a nice step away from FBI. And, yeah. and I've been getting texts lately that it's winning things and awards I and stuff I can totally like that. see so, why. It's so great. You know, I don't want to spoil it, yeah. but it's awesome. Yeah. So they're working on a, a script. So, um, you know. Oh, for a feature? Will, for a feature. Yeah. I so, can totally um, see that. That's awesome, dude. Yeah, yeah. Well, dude, two, two final questions. I don't want to take up all your day, man. For all the young Jeremy's out there that are kind of wide-eyed and insecure and figuring it out, any words of wisdom, advice you would have for them? Yeah, man, I don't know. Um, I guess it depends on the situation. I, I think um, it's funny. It's uh, it, it depends on where you are. And, you know, either, you know, I'm, I work with a certain amount of actors uh, in, in my show who are um, – who work in my jock or, or play the play the different analysts and, and agents and and they're they're guest stars i guess so they're yeah. kind of still in the world of looking for work yeah so, and say. so every time we're together we're always talking about agents and managers and auditions and all this stuff that i just i just hate it you yeah, know what i mean it's, I I spent, i've spent my entire life like just trying to get world. to a place where you don't have to do it anymore yeah <laughs> but just follow yeah. what you have to do focusing yeah. on how to get jobs and it's such a i just think it's such a, a i think it's a it feels like a waste of energy yeah. it feels just like a, a, and so uh if there's any way to cut to uh you know cut past that point and I wasn't able to do it. I'm still not able to do it. When this yeah. job ends, I'll go back to obsessing about how to get jobs. Yeah. Uh, so any advice I would give to any young actor, I don't know how to follow. Completely <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, uh, equipped to give it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe find a better coach. Maybe that's what the silver lining of this is. is I, I would, I would say there's no. I would say the thing that uh, I guess the thing I learned was like, if I'm going to do this weird thing. It's a weird job. It's a weird thing to go for. I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to like, I'm not going to be like, Oh, I've got to do it this way because they said I've got to do it this way. Um, you know, that there is absolutely no rules. There's absolutely no one way to do it. And um, whatever feels the most fun or the most you uh, really follow your bliss with it, you know, yeah. don't try to fit yourself into it, into a, a square peg or, or whatever that saying is. Um, I guess that would be my advice. 
Beautiful advice. Last question, man. During this crazy times, what's keeping you inspired? Um, my kids, I'm, I'm, my kids always, uh, you know, inspired and exhausted and, and, you know, they're, <laughs> they're, 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 you know, they're my, uh, they're a big, big part of everything. Um, and, uh, I've been, I've been, uh, trying to get better at guitar for the last couple of oh, years. I've nice. played for a long time, but actually understanding theory and kind of like get, getting to that next level. I've been doing a program. And so right now I'm in, my wife was like, why are you in a bad mood? I was like, I've just been practicing for an hour. It's just so frustrating. Uh, it's dropping the scales. Yeah. I know. Well, oh, dude. My God. yeah. yeah. Oh. So, um, so that's keeping me going. And, um, and, but this was a great interview. It was really nice talking to you, man. Dude, Jeremy Siso, I have so much fucking love for you, man. You're one of the best in the world. <laughs> Let's get coffee like, sometime in the city when you're not I working. Like and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll see you on the set of FBI as well. And do, I love that. To all that's to come, man, and, and the immense gratitude I have for you taking the time to give back and share means everything to me and to everyone listening. And the best is yet to come, brother. I, I have so much Appreciate faith in that. you. Appreciate yeah, right, that. Thank brother. you very much. It was great yeah. to be here. Yeah. All right, buddy. I am thrilled to announce that An Actor Despairs is partnering with a wonderful CBD company called Kind Farms. Everyone out there has heard of CBD. I started taking it a few years ago when I first started getting sober and to help with my anxiety. Sadly, as one can do, I was overtraining in the gym and a friend recommended a topical and a tincture to help with the pain. I tried it. It was okay. However, recently, I was introduced to a product that has really changed my life. Not only has it helped me with anxiety, but I am stronger than I have ever been. I'm able to carry out lifts my body used to prevent me from doing. Kind Farm products have single-handedly changed my life athletically and personally. They utilize 100% local licensed farmers, organic cultivation, and CO2 extraction for superior CBD. Kind Farms is turning CBD to a kind alternative to pharmaceuticals. Let's transform tobacco row into hemp row. If you want to get involved, please reach out. Together, we can make a difference. You can use my code RYAN10 for 10% off. You can find them on Instagram at Kind Farms Inc. All one word. That's K I N D P H A R M S I N C. And their website is kindfarmsinc.com. Once again, my code for 10% off is Ryan10.